Hello, and welcome to the Old Farm Bus Podcast. This is the back of the bus session. Hello, and welcome to the Old Farm Bus, back of the bus sessions podcast. We're back, baby. I've been buzzing for this one. I'm really excited about this podcast. I'm going to go straight in. Welcome aboard, Stephen Warnock. Yeah! <laughs> don't worry man i always go mental i put a little what is it a crowd noise underneath everyone thinks Lovely. the bus is rammed and actually it's just me you and my partner on it so welcome aboard brother cheers now, thanks for having me now Stephen, i'm not great at announcing going through everyone's accolades of what they've been on but if you yeah. could just quickly take me through your footballing timeline and i'm going to sort of dissect into that but if you could just tell me when you started off and where you ended up that'd be fantastic yeah uh so i started off as uh, a 10 year old at liverpool um graduated into the academy at liverpool had a couple of loan spells away at bradford and coventry uh, at the age of 20 21 22 made my liverpool debut stayed there for a couple of years went to blackburn rovers for two and a half years and went to Aston Villa for three and a half years, then went to <laughs> Leeds for two years um, with a couple of low moves and things in between. And then I ended up winding my career up at, um, at Bradford. Um, and then that was around about the age of 35. So I've been retired roughly about four years now. You've done that before, haven't you, mate? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I just, yeah. uh, I just nice. got going there, and I was on a roll. I think I missed a few things out. So. In your flow, yeah. you, it felt like you were freestyling. I kind of wanted to put a beat to it for a minute. <laughs> now, yeah. That f- for a lot of people, I've played football all my life, taught football to all my lad mates. My dad played at sort of semi-professional level, loves football. For a lot of people, that is the archetypal footballer's dream of what you lived out but it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows really you struggle with a lot of mental health through that a lot of mental battles um and going through that so I want to take us on that path today now is football been your life from birth in essence have you been in a very football related family yeah pretty much um my my brother was my brother's four years older than me and um we used to play football in the street there was a few of the neighbors who, who would come and play and it was basically we lived in a in a cul-de-sac or in a, uh, yeah in a cul-de-sac if you like and we'd play football down there because we knew there was no cars coming um <laughs> he was a good footballer as well so always playing against him being four years older was always like a challenge to me um and I found it made me very competitive and always wanted to get the better of him um but we, we grew up in a split family as well as um, as in the fact of my dad and my brother are both Evertonians. My mum my mm. are Liverpoolians, so it was a, a competitive household, should we say, but a, a good one. Um, yeah, but football's been part of my life since I can remember. I, I grew up loving it and um, pretty much don't know any difference. I think there's a... I mean, you, you always think back of how committed you are to something. I just remember... Um, you interview most footballers and they say, what would you have done if you hadn't been a footballer? And they don't have an answer mm. because they're that committed to doing it. And I think the more we get into this, that's probably one of the problems as well. Mm. Especially to get to them elite levels, you've got to be that committed in anything you're doing. Yeah. I'm really interested in your early life because you say football was always there. What about mental health? Because I do think mental health stems very strongly from how you were brought up as a kid and sort of who you're going to become later on. Was that the case for you? Or did you sort of have, again, I'll say the word archetypal, but the nice family household and loving family, parents, friends, did it all go in workings together? Or was there any dysfunction? Yeah, loads of dysfunction. Um, My mum and dad had had problems they separated at times and uh they're, they're still together now but they they had a turbulent marriage if you like and and it was up and down so roughly around about the age of 14 I sort of got to know about sorry flying <laughs> around uh, I got to know about that um and that was something that was again for me 
it was not showing a sign of weakness and it was just, well, it's not my problem. Just leave it and get on with it. Uh, leave it out the way. Uh, I lost my my best friend at the age of 14. He was knocked, uh, knocked down by a train. Wow. Um, so I lost him at 14. And then I lost my one of my other close friends, best friends. There was like the three of us who used to knock around all the time together. Mm. And I lost him at the age of 17 to a car crash. And yeah, the, the, just little things. And um, that, that add up where you go, they're not nice now when you look back at them and you you grieve them more now, I think, anyway, and think about it probably deeper. Whereas at the time, I was just, don't show weakness. Um, don't show a side to you that people haven't seen. Do you think that's what made you so tenacious in accelerating and achieving and going through it? Because you had such pain inside you, but that sort of did accelerate you. To a certain degree, yeah. Mm. Um, but then looking back on it now, it probably held me back. Okay. Um, be- because I was angry and I was suppressing things that were inside. Um, I also lost my auntie, um, who was someone who used to take me to football all the time. I used to go on holiday with every single year uh, with my family as well. But she was like my my second mum. She she used to do so much for me and we were a really close family. Um so all, all those things are, they add up and they, they, they get on top of you. Mm. Um, and at some point they catch up. Uh, and I think it got to a point where, yeah, everything suddenly does catch up. Because mm. uh, I can, it, I'm quite empathic on this front because I had a lot of dysfunction in the household. You know, uh, somebody said something beautiful to me recently when I went into a school, it was a speaker and she said, I don't judge a kid on the amount of money in the household, but I judge it on the amount of love that's being shown in that household. And, you know, I live on a farm. Everyone got the wrong idea at school because they thought, oh, it's the rich kids coming in. And we really aren't that. If you know farming, there's no money involved. It's just constant debt and recyclement of that. Always buying stuff in. Um, But I I was a social butterfly And I just wanted love because my mum was just a tenacious lady, always wanting to achieve, building, building, building. And as I said so many times, I only had you because your dad wanted you. I've never wanted kids. I don't like kids. (laughs) She she openly said that. And, you know, as a kid, that's really painful to hear. So I built up this sort of feeling of need for validation. So then Mm -hmm. that's what I was saying in in the football term for you. I ended up being a fat kid, really big kid, but that made me a good prop forward for rugby. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> and it's pros and cons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I ended up uh, really early on, because this is a true story, brother. I went to the doctors because I was in there weekly for being so big. And Dr. Rugby <laughs> told me to go and play rugby. Incredible. I swear on my life. Uh, and it did. <laughs> I went to, uh, to Derby Rugby Club, really great team. And played for them for a long, long time until later on, end up breaking my leg when I was playing sort of like NLD standards, which was your county and whatnot. Yeah. And I really remember being there and thinking for the first time ever, oh my God, we're winning every game we're playing. We're getting cheers. I've scored a try. Everyone goes mad for you. And I felt accepted. So yeah. it, it, it was this feeling of, oh, wow, I really want to do well in this. It's the place mm. where I'm getting some love. I'm feeling comfortable. So it's a safety blanket. It re- Yeah, amen to that. And is that yeah. when you were going to trial or playing for Liverpool so early on, is that a similar feeling you, you were getting? Yeah, I'll just touch on something. Mm. When, when you mentioned about a mistake being a mistake, mm. it, it drives me mad or saying, sorry, that's your your mum said she didn't want you and it was your dad who pushed it. Mm. It drives me mad when I, when I'm out with families or with people and they say you were a mistake. And I Mm. always think, imagine what that kid feels now. Dude. And Mm. it's just horrible. And I was actually, um, actually heard it not so long ago. And I just remember wondering, because they actually, it was the, the child who said it. And I was thinking what the parents would say. And they actually, they, they answered it so well. Um, and I, I just thought, because it gave the, the child 
the feeling of no, you you were wanted. Mm. And it was such a good spin on the answer. And I thought, well, credit mm. to you because you could have answered that a different way because it was like a little running joke between the family, between the siblings. And the mum and dad just put it to bed straight away. And I thought, no, that's the best way to do that. But what you often find with, I think it's with any sport, but it was mm. always talked about in football was um, players will always lose family members. And the answer always is, get back get back on the pitch. It's where you can disappear. Mm. Because you've got so many other things to think mm. about on a football pitch. But you're not happy going onto that football pitch, so you're never going to perform at the level you want to perform at. The only time you will perform at your absolute maximum is when you're happy, when everything around you is working well. Mm. And people often wonder where confidence goes and where confidence comes from. Confidence comes from being happy. Mm. It comes from everything around you being happy. And when everything, when you're happy with everything around you, if you do make a mistake on a football pitch, it disappears. Mm. It doesn't matter. It becomes irrelevant. It's not a huge issue. But when you're, when you're in a mindset of, I've just lost someone, mm. you then misplace a pass or you misplace something. And suddenly your thought is, I don't even want to fucking be here. Mm. I don't want to be here anyway. I've got too much going on to deal with this. Whereas when you're happy, it's like, oh, well, yeah. okay. The That's, next one will work. It, it goes back to that. You've made a mistake. You keep making mistakes. Therefore, I am a mistake. And that yeah, takes you straight absolutely. back to that childhood feeling of, yep, this is yep. all just one big mistake. What is the point? Yeah. Dude, I've felt that so strongly in anything I've tried. And how old are you now, Stephen, out of interest? 39, 39. Do you still get hindered uh, by these things we've been left with, these negative traits? Does it still come into your life? Oh, yeah, of course it does, but it's, mm. it's how quickly you can deal with it. Mm. Um, they're the things that I am learning at the moment. I practice as much as I can to deal with these situations because these situations pop up hundreds of times a day, mm. probably, I'd say anyway where little things happen where it will remind you of something, whether it's, it can be even a song, a conversation, anything, a picture, something that just takes you back to a certain memory that mm. was, was, was hard to take or was awkward. Um, and I, I like listening to sort of magic and like old radio stations, which takes me back to my childhood. Because yeah. I want to remember songs that I loved, but I also want to remember the songs that hurt as well and why yeah. they hurt and, and mm. things like that. And that's something that I've, I've learned in the, recently is to do that and to, to work out why they hurt you and what the reason was for it. So, um, yeah, it's trying to practice every single day that those moments that are tough and hard to deal with, you've got you've to be able to to banish them quick, not banish them, but deal with them mm. because they'll never, they'll never go away, but it's how, how, how long you, you rest on them for essentially. Honestly, man, like <laughs> it's so refreshing and beautiful and vital for people to pick up on that because when you say go through your, your pain and you yeah. get to this side of new wisdom, new knowledge, a lot of people call it enlightenment, <laughs> mm -hmm. but yeah. you, you take on that. But then people think, that's it now. My arm is there for life. I've done. And you can get really complacent with it. And then yeah. when the inevitable happens and you do start going through turmoil again, struggle and disrupt, everyone goes, hang on. I thought I had the, the solution for that. What's happening? And yeah. I, I, it's so lovely for you to say, no, do you know what? It's just a, a building process all the time. Life's constant. Life's changing. You're forever mm. going to have to just keep on working on yourself. And then traits that you picked up through childhood and then through extra pain that you picked up on the way, it's going to keep coming back and, and nibbling at you. But you've just got yeah. better coping mechanisms. And I, I really, dude, it's so refreshing to hear that. Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing I've, I've worked on is, and this is what I work with. I mean, you, you've listened to Paul speak, Paul Cope, who's uh, someone who I work with. <laughs> Week in, week out. Yeah, I mean, um, for those who don't know, basically he saved me. He, mm. he literally saved my life and, and helped me get, get to where I am now and, and how I feel. 
But the one of the things that we work on is we, we get really frustrated with people who, who, who project this, you've got to love yourself, telling yourself how, how you love yourself, stand in the mirror, I love you, and this is how you feel, and all this. It's easy to love the best bits of you. That's the easiest part to love. Mm. The hardest part to love and to work out where the true happiness comes from is the bits that you don't like about yourself and that That's have hurt you in shivers. the past. <laughs> it's just giving me shivers. Yeah. yeah. But they're the bits that people don't want to work on because they don't want to bring that up because they know how hard it's going to hurt you. I remember when I sat down with Paul, he went, um, the hardest part is going to be digging out the, the toughest parts of your life where it's going to really hurt you and you're going to suffer and you're going to cry and you're going to not going to, you're not going to want to talk about it. But when you start to talk about it, it brings different sides of you out and it brings out the, the or it gets rid of the suppression that you've held for so long. And um, they're the bits I concentrate on the most, mm. the bits where people get frustrated with me. And I think, why do people get frustrated with me? Why am I, why do I get frustrated by things as well? And often the, the frustrating parts of our lives are self-reflection, which mm. we don't like about ourselves, which we, which we see in others, but we also see in ourselves. Mm. So it's a constant sort of game every day to, to understand that as well. Have you got an example of one of those traits you've got and then what you do to, to help deal with it? Well, there's, there's loads. <laughs> do, you ever, do, you ever, do you ever drive your car and someone doesn't wave to you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's the and face. And you get pissed off. Yeah. Do you get pissed off by it? Yeah. So, again, it, it's like, have you ever, ever not waved to someone and thanked them? Definitely. <laughs> In my past, I've, I'm sure I've done it. Exactly, but we we believe that we're the perfect person who's done it every single time. Yeah, and that they're the little things. Have you ever held the door for someone? That this is the way sort of me, me well well Paul put it to me was we enter into small contracts with people, silent contracts, but they don't know about the contract that you've entered into. Hmm. So as you let that person go you're expecting them to thank you because you give them a contract to say, well, if I let you go, you've got to thank me. And they don't thank you, so you get pissed off by it. But they didn't know the contract was in place. Mm. And it's like hold, holding a door for someone. And you hold the door for someone. And I do it all the time when people walk through and they go, and I go, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> and, but the thing is, though, they didn't say to me as, I was walk, as they were walking to that door, if you hold that door for me, I'm going to thank you on the way past. There's no, there's, it's a silent contract that you enter into, but you're not telling the other side about. Mm. And they're a battle every single day mm. because you've got something in your head where you think, well, I was brought up like that or I was thinking. Yeah. And it's just little things like that that you you often battle with yourself. You count, uh... where you're thinking, hang about, take a step back. Did I actually ask them to thank me before I held the door or let them go? And you've just got to go, Sometimes it, it's, it's out of your control. So is that your way of dealing, just having a self-reflective moment where you could go back and go, hang on a minute, is that a way of dealing with that situation? Because you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're being ego-led there. You've got all these ideas about you. You're looking at them. You're going, this is how they should respond. Something happens. And again, you just, you just snap because you're not being reflective or self-aware in that situation. Yeah, yeah so, absolutely. So the other side of it as well, like I, I pull my brother up on it all the time, my dad, and uh, it's something that I've, I always notice. And when I've done this work, it's something that I've reflected on. Whenever we go to a restaurant, my, my dad and my brother have an expectancy of what service should be and how mm. it should be. And if there's certain times where they're sat there and they'll get the food put out and they're in a conversation, but they don't say thank you. And I'll thank them on behalf of them. And when you actually think back to it, there's so many times when you're sat in a restaurant or a, a bar or whatever it might be, and you're that deep in a conversation that you actually forget to do it yourself. There's moments where I think um, when you're in a car as well, and you can drive to somewhere and you can actually forget half of the journey that you've made mm. because you're so deep somewhere else that you forget about it. Mm. And I often think of that now is that people are that. They're not in it. 
they're yeah. not they're not present at that moment in time. So sometimes you just have to sit back and go, and they're not with it today. Hmm. They're wow. that deep in a conversation. Um, you, you've got to. We, we judge everything that goes on in life now, and we 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 try and find faults in anything that goes on, and I think that's the the side I'm trying to to find peace with is that. Hmm. Don't get angry by the little things because the, the little things end up getting... So that little thing that you might see at a restaurant mm, adds up. up and goes to the next thing. Yeah. Suddenly you walk, you get to the end of the day and you go, what a shit day <laughs> that was. So many things got to me. Whereas if you just sit back and go, it's not in my, it's, it's out of my control. It's one of those things. They were in the moment. And you know, if at the end of the meal, you haven't said please and thank you during that period. But when you get up and leave and say to the waitress, thanks very much today. That was really nice. Thanks for your help. Mm. You've done it. Yeah. It doesn't have to be every single time. And what, I, what I've also learned is I've, I've got two girls who are 13 and 15. Uh-huh. And I used to be obsessed on telling them to say please and thank you every single time that you were in a restaurant. So someone puts a glass down, puts a knife and fork down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. You don't have to. Yeah. It's it's at the it's at the end of the whole thing that's important. So as you leave, and you thank them, that's the one they'll remember. Mm. It's not all the little ones in between. It's the main thank you, which is a when I, when I think about this, when I put myself in the situation, I'm sat there and I'm I'm talking to people, and he's putting the thing in over my shoulder, <laughs> and I'm thank thank you. I don't even look at him. I don't make eye to eye. I don't make eye to eye contact. But as soon as I get up and leave that restaurant. And I look at him face to face and thanks very much yeah. for your, uh, today, for your service. That was great. Thank you. He takes that on board. He won't even think about the little ones there. But mm. I, was, I was usually worrying about them situations thinking, uh, he's thinking I'm rude here. Or he's thinking my, my brother's rude or my dad's rude or whoever it might be. So they're the little things that you build up in your head as well again. Mm. Sorry to rabbit on. No, I love it. Please do. Any opportunity, rabbit on. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really true because... It sounds disingenuous after a while, doesn't it? My, my yeah. partner, who I love dearly, sometimes I, I do just always just go, I love you, love you. And she actually said the other day, don't say it until we have a proper connection moment together where yeah. we're having a heartfelt, meaningful time. And you look at me and you go, I, I love you. I'm so thankful that you're a part of my life. Yeah. And that's where the authenticity comes from. And yeah. You lose it. You lose it, don't you? It's not genuine. Yeah, it's like you feel you have to say it to satisfy someone. So true, man. Yeah. Uh, what one thing you touched on then was the present moment, being present, and I can imagine you and Paul, the the main man who touched my heart as well, Paul Cope. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> He's, you two doing wonderful things. What are some practical advice that you have to help people get to that present moment um, that they can do on the daily? even when they're not feeling shit or not in a heated situation, but they're just practicing. Yeah. Are there some things that Paul's give you that have been a bit of a revolution? Yeah, we have a journal, awesome. uh, write things down. What, what, so, so during a, almost like a, a we did it over two weeks, uh, a week to two weeks. And what we said was write down the things that frustrate you. So the little things like waving and the, the meals and what have you, and then actually strip them back and look at them and why they do frustrate you, how I just explained then. But what you'll find is there's hundreds, there's hundreds and hundreds of little things that really frustrate you. And if you took them out, well, took them out of your life and dealt with them and just sort of brushed them to the side, actually makes your day go so much easier and so much freer. Um, so it's it's being aware of what's going on and what is frustrating you. That's the biggest thing that you've got to, to learn from it is the, the little things. Um, I know when you listened to Paul, you, you talked about the, the characters mm. um, oh, and the dear. traits of, of people. So for people who, who don't know that, um, <laughs> what, what, we, what we work on, and I hope Paul doesn't mind me telling people, but I, I know he spoke about it on, a, on another podcast, um, we have so many characters of ourselves. So there isn't one Stephen Warnock as probably 20, 30, 40 different characters. And that is a character who goes on a night out. It's a character who's in work. It's a parent. It's a, uh, a partner. It, it's a friend. It's whatever it might be. 
but you bring out certain characters in certain situations to help make you feel comfortable in that situation and to, to work around people and it almost satisfies people. Um, <clears throat> so what you'll often find is, and again, if you go back to this for people who, who are wondering what I'm talking about, go back to the car situation or holding the door. And is there ever a time when someone doesn't wave to you and you just ignore it and you just walk, you just walk through. So what's the difference in the character that day to the one who gets pissed off? So it's a different character who's, who's, mm. at, who's present at that moment in mm. time. So there might be frustrated Stephen Warnock who goes, yeah, you're welcome. Mm. But then the next day you might get Stephen Warnock who's in a great mood, who's a different character who goes, not a problem today, just carry on walking. You don't even give it a second thought, but it depends who's present at that moment in your character. Mm. And I think that is the big thing you've got to try and work out is to try and sort of push certain characters back and get rid of them mm. and build your characters into one big character who, who is able to deal with things. Now, I, I'd say I've probably narrowed my characters down now. I've got a list there, which is probably 30 or 40 characters. I think I've got it down now roughly to maybe five to 10, mm. which is really good. I think anyway, I've, I've worked so hard on this to try and get it right. And what I mean by that is if I turn up to, if I turn up to work or I go out with my kids, you're getting, you're getting similar people. Mm. You're getting a, a genuine person who thinks the same way, who, who acts the same way. Um, don't get me wrong. It's different because of the relationships, but you're getting a consistency with my personality. Mm. And that's what I'm trying to bring. I'm not trying to bring someone who goes to work and who's like, yes, 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 yes. And does everything that they tell you because you want to get by. If you've got an opinion about something, have that opinion, but have it in the right way. Don't mm. just be a, a passive person. Um, and it's got to be the same with the kids as well. Don't be something that you're not. Be genuine. Be who you want to be. Um, mm. And they're the little things that I, I've worked on so, so hard over the last sort of five, six months. But I'm noticing the difference now as well, that when I turn up and meet people, um, I'm, I feel like, people might tell me what different, but I feel like I'm good fun. I feel like I'm present in the conversation that I'm having with them, which is important. Um, I listen to every word that they say and try and either help them or agree with them, disagree with them. And I think that's hugely important as well. Whereas previously, I'd turn up to certain conversation or certain meetings with people and I couldn't be bothered mm. and I was just like I'm not I'm not involved in this because I've got other things going on in my head um so yeah it's just trying to find the consistency with with your personality as well dude that was that was amazing and that podcast uh, I've been working with Daniel James from the Prime Life Project podcast which I think is yeah. absolutely fantastic we met through doing a podcast on this bus and then later on I went and started working for him for a bit and all of his content has been fantastic throughout since then. Uh, since me and me. <laughs> <laughs> well, do, do you know what the thing is, though? Do you know what you've just said there? Yeah. Like, it's really important that you you do that, though, where people, people are so quick to put themselves down. Mm. Do you ever notice that as well? People can't wait to to put themselves down in front of people. They see it almost like, um, like it's, a, it's a cool thing to do. Mm. But you've, you've got to give yourself a pat on the back every now and again. Because if you don't, who say, will? Yeah. yeah. And you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to give yourself credit when, mm. when, you think you de when you think you deserve it. And the thing is, it's like it's not, not so much when you think you deserve it. You know when you deserve it. Mm. Because yeah, you know, because you, you, you get this great feel. Yeah, you do. You get this great mm. feeling inside you. And you know you've done right. Dude. Um, but then there's the other side of it where when you know you've done wrong. Yeah. And that's yeah. when you just self, that's when you self reflect and you sit down and you go, okay. Um, one of the big things that when I talk about the self reflection as well is when I talked about the journal is what, what upsets you in the day? What gets to you? What, what do you go to bed at night thinking? Because they're often the things that you need to write down and mm. work out. Because if you don't, they'll keep on going for, for years and years and years and years. 
and this is where depression comes in. Mm. And it just keeps on setting in. It, it, it's like it's like the concrete setting, but yeah. it's not over. It's it doesn't take an hour to set. Yeah. It takes years to set, and sometimes it never sets, but it's always there. And that's mm. the that's the difficult thing to to work out. So uh, yeah, my advice to anyone is is always get a journal and keep writing. That well, that's going to be my takeaway for today, dudes. And me and my partner have all we always talk about it. We're like, why don't we just journal this down? Because we do have days where we just feel really so much struggle and we, we've got a business together we, we also work in education Chris is yeah. very creative I do poetry and if you don't have stuff in front of you and down and structure and then not even just the structured side but what's going on in your head at the time it yeah. becomes so confusing it becomes so all over the place so that is my big takeaway from you today I'm actually going to bloody do it instead of keep talking <laughs> about it but, it's, um, it's, it's huge though because as well I, I'm sorry to interrupt you there no, but of course, like one, one of the other things that we've spoke about is like when you set goals in life like do you ever achieve them do you ever get to where you want to get to and um, it was something like really interesting that that Paul did and it, it stuck with me because it was something that I took away from, from one of our uh, sort of sessions was um, he said, what do you want to achieve in five months from this? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, I want this, this and this. So he said, OK, write an email to yourself now to land in five months hmm. and look at that email in five months and see if, you, see if you've completed it. Hmm. But you can you can you can write emails to yourself or letters to yourself for years to come huh. and see if you hit them goals and see if you achieve what you're really after in life because often subconsciously we're concentrating on trying to reach them goals which you don't even realize and i think it, it's brilliant at times to to look at things like that because often you'll you'll read back on the email and you'll go i've got away from that there might be one point in it that you go, oh, God, I've not concentrated on that at all. And it just jogs your memory. But it's often the same with the journal as well. One of the most important things about having a journal is, and what I do more often than not is, I always read the first day and where mm. I was at and how low I was at. Mm. And they're, they're, the, they're the times when you know you're, you're progressing or you're getting to where you need to be as well. Mate. That's stunning. And I, where I was just going back with the, the Daniel thing, over the, to just big myself up, was, <laughs> yeah. uh, was saying, I, I do want to touch on that bit that you and Paul have worked on with the characters, because mm. that was my huge epiphany moment. That yeah. was massive to me because... It was mine as well. Dude, I... I've told on this podcast, and I'm very open on this podcast, uh, my depression was a real big integral part of my life and it pushed me into like really substances and so on and I went a little yeah. bit a bit wild with it I got a uh, psychosis I got schizophrenia I really struggled um hard um and to the point I was close to being sectioned I don't know right. how it was just my pure tenacity it was no I'm gonna get over this because I love my grandma to bits and the moment I started questioning my grandma's truth towards me I thought she was trying to poison me and stuff genuinely uh that's yeah. where i went no mikey you've gone way too far down this rabbit hole you've got to come back now mate uh and i did it did it for that pure premise but everything i've learned by doing daniel's podcast and and all the amazing people he's had on they're all sort of stuff that that i've known but they've just said it in different ways and which is a great yeah. way of learning things Paul's thing was something that I strongly felt, but a lot of people, when I was trying to explain it to them, 18, 19, I was doing this, all told me I was mental <laughs> because I was, yeah. I was calling it chameleon in. I said, I, I feel like I'm a different person in a party where it's crazy Mikey time. And then I'm, yeah. I go on stages and perform. So I've got rhythmical Mike, who's the entertainer and performer inside of things. And I was just explaining to people, I've got nine people in my head. And yeah. they all literally said, like, my best mate was like, you need to get yourself checked, dude. You need to calm it down. And to yeah. an extent, they were right, because what I was allowing was all nine people at some time to turn up to the microphone and talk over yeah. each other. And it was, it was convoluted. It was wild. It was crazy. And it didn't make sense to people. But later down the line, working with Dan, 
Paul Cope comes on podcast, really excited. Don't know what it's going to be about. His book is, what's it called? The Answers for Everything. Yeah. yeah I was much. like, here we go. This is, <laughs> I'm yeah, looking yeah. forward to that. And a big, bold statement. But the guy does have the answers for everything, actually, because I love him. Um, but yeah, towards the end of that podcast, when he started talking about those people in your head, actually giving them names but what it is and literally to me this felt like mikey what it is is having them all there but sending them to the mic and being so aware of self that you know who's there at that time and who's appropriate for that situation and i've lived like that since that podcast i've really reflected ever since man it's i've not wrote them down yet but i think there is that day coming but yeah, we, we put on festivals and events and I think, right, Rhythmical Mike's got to come to stage now, but it genuinely is Rhythmical Mike's there. And then as soon as somebody comes and goes, oh, the sound's gone or, oh, he's not turned up or this band aren't here. I literally, I can pull out Rhythmical Mike now. I send him Michael Markham and he goes, okay, this is what we're going to do. And it just, it works yeah. in that situation. So it can be as fast as that as well. It doesn't have to be day to day. It can be mm. in the next moment. And, and that's honestly, the beauty of it. Paul giving yeah. me that allowance, Paul giving me that feeling of, oh, okay, this isn't a problem. It's just learning to channel it and being strong with it. I think yeah. so many people could radically change their lives around if they understand this premise. So I suppose what this yeah, podcast I, today is, get in touch with Paul Cope. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, listen, it, I mean, when it was explained to me and the way it was explained, I... Um, I actually watched a film a couple of weeks ago, and I don't know whether you've seen it, but have you seen Rocket Man with Elton John? No, I've not seen that one yet. Not seen it. So, so if if you watch that, you'll realise where the characters are. So Elton John is a normal person. He was uh, a stage man dressed in drag or dressed in different clothing when he went on stage because it was a different character. It was a character that he wanted to be seen on stage but he was comfortable in he wasn't comfortable as himself so he had to portray a new character so the best in the world do it but it always comes back to haunt them because he ended up being an alcoholic a drug addict and a depressant Mm. because he didn't know how to control them Mm. and he didn't know when to bring them out how to bring them out and what the right situations were and it wasn't until Elton John got to about I think it was about 60 odd 50 or 60 until mm. he went to counsel and went to uh checked himself in and then he learned how to deal with it wow well, you didn't see elton john that many times afterwards dressed in all these fancy outfits yeah because there became a self-belief that it, it it's a self-worth no they'll accept me for who i am hmm. because i am good enough but they didn't think they were so they tried to hide behind he tried to hide behind the costumes and I was sat there and I was watching the film thinking, bloody hell, this at home. Yeah. And it is, it's, it's one of those feelings where you're almost hiding behind a mask because you're worried about what people will think about you. Mm. Um, and it, it's so true. So uh, if you get the chance, watch it and let me know what you think about uh, it. Mate, I think you'll be, uh, you'll be interested to see. I, w- I will. And it's, I have a funny anecdote about a similar premise, but it, it's on a different regard because my friend who does struggle severely with mental health and I, I love him to bits and I always have to be there to sort of help him out but what's the other film with it's on Queen it's not Rocket Man there's another Bohem- one Bohemian Rhapsody yes and this guy yeah. is an absolutely incredible performer he can play any instrument and it is it's performative art on stage he's got a mask on and does all this weird stuff yeah. he he is quite led by his ego and his narcissism, unfortunately. Yeah. And he'll admit to that. But he watched that uh, Bohemian Rhapsody one and he took away the complete wrong message because he uh, was watching it and seeing Freddie Mercury go off and do all these drugs but be on massive shows and be wild, crazy man. But I know in that film, he actually loses sense of himself, loses all his friends, really struggles with his mental health (laughs) but man the next day my friend had watched that film in the cinema and he just uh he'd call around all his band mates and said right we need to be 
on this mission. We need to turn into this, da, 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 and just telling everyone they weren't good enough and they, they weren't given enough wow. time and so on. And it is just funny from what you said then. You've watched a film, found a beautiful pearl of wisdom and premise from it, where but some people can watch something and take a completely different thing out of it. And it was like, no, yeah. can you not remember what happened in that film? Can you not remember what you visioned? And he lost everything from it and got really ill. And yeah, my, my friend, we had to all literally have an intervention, sit him down and just say, dude, <laughs> re yeah, re you've, watch it. you've read this wrong. Yeah. yeah, watch it again and go and take something else away from it. But I, I love that. I think that's an important idea, actually, is when you're watching something and you're feeling so strongly about it, is there other things that can be taken? Is there other messages? What else is this art trying to represent in a, in a way? Yeah, I think that's, that's the big thing is you look at so many um sort of superstars and a lot of them are are, are musicians mm. because they are creative artists like you say and they're the ones who suffer the most with depression because they try and recreate themselves we often hear this don't we mm. in the press where well, he's recreated himself he's gone away and he's he's come back different mm. he's, he's just create he's just created another character in his head another alter ego mm. that's effectively all he's done or she's done but it's not them and it's not them in the present. So it's only going to work. It's only going to lead one way. Hmm. It's only going to lead to a downfall at some point. And, and it's how, how quickly that person or someone around them realizes that this is a smoke screen and yeah. they're actually not happy one bit. It's why I love seeing Ed Sheeran. Ed Sheeran's never got away from who he is. Yeah. He's never got away from the, the geeky musician. Who's <laughs> to, who's just an absolute genius. He doesn't do anything abnormal he doesn't act strange or do anything different um and it's it's massive credit to someone who's an absolute global superstar hmm. but there's other people even the fact of lady gaga when you listen to her backstory she came from a, a massive catholic family who didn't want her to do what she was going to do she used to be a stripper when she was younger and things like this and um lady gaga all of a sudden comes out in these strange clothes big wigs and things like that and you think why mm. well she's trying to portray something that she's not mm. but she's trying to hide behind it to get accepted as that character that alter ego move on down the line now we see her as herself and she's yeah. brilliant and people now because she's confident within herself to do that but she's had struggles along the way there's mm. so many people who've had those struggles where um often people think it's a uh, it's an act that has to be portrayed. You have to bring someone different to the table. Mm. You don't. It's just to cover you, cover yourself and make yourself feel better in the short term. And it's a good segue from this because we're talking about superstars, but that's my field, like the music scene and so on. You yeah. must see it riddled in the sports industry and, and scene. Yeah. And one thing that really stuck with me from Dan's podcast you did was saying about the academies, you know, you've got so many young lads with probably quite a, a lot of self-esteem because they're sit sitting at a Liverpool table with a Liverpool shirt and or whatever it is, um, yeah. who have been told this dream, look where you're at, you're going to get there, you're going to be fine, here we go. So they've sold everything else off. They're like, well, I'm, I don't need anything else. Now, I've been to so many schools, mate, as a poetry teacher, work with so many yeah. students, and they're just like, I'm, I'm going to be a footballer, I'm going to be a famous footballer. I'm like, that's amazing. Yeah. I love that yeah. confidence, respect to you, man. But come on, <laughs> like, in every moment, in every session you're in, why don't you put that enthusiasm that you got into football into this moment now? Because we're here for an hour now. Let's go for it. Yeah. So you've got all these lads together in these academies and rooms. You must see such a, a struggle with when they don't get what they want, when they don't make it. Have, have, yeah, absolutely. Have you seen but that unfold? There's a, there's a flip side to this. Mm. And again it's something we've worked on is I wanted to be a footballer when I was younger and there was nothing else in my head apart from making that now why have a plan b because if you don't have a if you don't if you have a plan b mm. you're not fully focused on plan a mm. now if plan a finishes 
and you don't get to where you want to be, then start a new plan. Mm. The problem with football is, though, and this is, this is the big problem, is when you're talking about someone who's in college and they want to be, I don't know, a writer, an actress, or whatever it might be, mm. the difference being is, is the footballer gets paid, let's talk, a £1,000 a week mm-hmm. from a certain age, whereas the actress or the writer or whatever it might be is still an education. And doesn't. Mm. Now the footballer is used to the thousand pound a week coming in every week. Mm. So where does he go after there? How does he then find that again? And this is the problem. Because people think the, the world revolves around money. Mm. And it does to a certain degree. Let's not deny that. But they worry that, where am I going to make more money next? Rather than taking a step back and going, okay, I'm going to have to reset. I've earned nice money but I'm going to have to go back to college and I'm going to have to learn for a couple of years and I'm going to have to take a hit. What does it all come down to? It all comes down to appearance again, what people perceive of you, what people think about you Mm. and what you think people think about you. Mm. Oh, you're a failed footballer. No, well, I'm actually, I'm not. I had, well, okay. I might, failed's not the right word. I had a go. I wasn't good enough. I didn't quite make the grade. I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to give my life a different run now and I'm going to go to the next challenge because I didn't make it. Mm. And that's often where you've got to get to. I think the perception is, or the, the worry for, for the players who, who don't quite make it is, is that that tale, and this is where we go back to the story being told in our heads again, is everywhere he looks, he's a failed footballer. That's his, that's his concern all the time. And this is why we often see lads who are coming out the game now really, really struggling with depression, with moving on in the life, Mm. because it's what people tell them constantly. I remember I was when I was younger, I was at Liverpool and I went to uh, Bradford on loan. And I remember being out with a few of my mates and there was a girl and we'd had a bit of a, a, a difference in, let's say, uh, we didn't really get on at the time. Um, and she turned around to me and went, uh, she, she was pissed and whatever. And she turned around and she said, uh, huh, you failed, didn't you? Look at you now, you're at Bradford. And I remember thinking, and straight away, I, it, it, it cut me a little bit. And I was like, cheeky cow, uh, I'm still playing. Yeah. I'm still doing it. But that was at that level where I haven't dropped out the game. But could you imagine people going, talking behind your back or feeling like they're talking behind your back? Mm. Rather than starting a new life, doing something great, and people will go, I'll tell you what, he's done well there, hasn't he? Like leaving football and starting up his new life and big respect to him and, and, and well done to you. Mm. But we never tell that story yeah. because we always want to be that. We always want the negative stories, don't we? We always want to beat people up and, and bring them down. And I think that's the big thing that when I look at footballers coming out the game now, it's having the, the sort of the sense of, and this goes back to my career. I remember when we spoke on Daniel's podcast and, and Paul's podcast, I spoke about how I look back on my career and with disappointment and not overly proud of it. Mm. That was what I used to think. But when I look back on it now, I actually self-reflect and go, no, you had a good career. Yeah. It took me three, three and a half years to get to that point where I've actually looked at my career and gone, do you know what? You did well. Mm. You actually did very well because there's, and that's the, that's the side of things where we often beat ourselves up again. It's interesting, isn't it? There's a quote uh, that came to mind when you said everything then. And it's uh, this was one that I had to really piece through, but it's uh, you're not who you think you are. You're who you think they think you are. Correct, dude. And yeah. I, I remember when I heard it. I was so like, true. Oh God, that's 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 power. That's real power. And yeah. again, I, I'm in a bus now. But if this bus had a hundred people in it, every single person in this bus is going to have a completely different perception of who I am. Hundred percent. They're all. But, gonna... you, but you think they've all got the same one? Exactly. And exactly. And that's the worry, and, isn't it? And and the yeah. funny thing is, like you said, with that woman, for there's some reason our egos always want to go 
to the negative ones. We always sort of go around, look around that hundred people on a bus and go, oh, he thinks I'm a tit. And maybe he actually does think I'm a tit and I'm not a good performer. Yeah. But that will matter to me so much more than the, the yeah. other 30 or 40 or 100, uh, 99 that all go, yeah. oh, he's, he's well, doing his best. It's like... It's like Twitter, isn't it? Twitter's the worst world, the worst place in the world. Yeah. Because you could do a podcast now and we could review this podcast and we could go, do you know what? We'll, I'll tell you what, we'll sit down after it and we'll we'll review all the Twitter comments. Mm. And there could be, we could get a thousand comments and 999 of them could be yeah. great. But that one person who's negative will piss us off the most. Yeah. <laughs> and it'll hurt us the most. <laughs> Rather than looking at the 999 going, do you know what? We've absolutely smashed it there. Every time. and But we'll okay. both walk away thinking uh, so that one person. I, I, I suppose that that's the truth is with that, to help people that do have that low self-esteem about self because you've built up a perception from what you think people think about you. Yeah. You must have been... As a footballer, you must have this all the time. You're going to have people saying the shittest things possible to you. I get it now. You still get, get it now. Because uh, yeah, you're doing yeah. a lot of talk shows and stuff, aren't you, as well? So you are in the public sphere. So yeah, would yeah. you say just one great piece of advice to people? And this is something I've genuinely done now. Don't read the comments, good or bad. Oh, I, I don't have my... On my, my social media pages, I only have people who follow me, mm. um, who I can read their comments. Mm. I, uh, you're going to get people who, who want to who want to rise out of you, mm. who want to be negative, and more often than not, what I've learned to what I've learned to understand now is, again, it comes to self reflection. Mm. So those those people who are negative towards you are struggling themselves in life. So I actually feel sorry for them, and yeah. half the time I want to reach out and say, "You okay?" Because you, you're obviously in a bad place yourself, and that's where I've got to. But what I've also realized as well is switch the TV on or switch the radio on, switch anything on. There's certain people I don't like. Yeah. Or there's certain people I don't want to watch or I don't agree with. That's fine. Mm. Why, can, why can I have that opinion to myself, but those people can't as well? Mm. The hardest part to take about it is, is just that it's written down yeah. or you see it. Now, that's just part and parcel. That is just an acceptance that we've got to have in life. Now, mm. if, if, you, if I went and stood in front of a room and made a speech and 400 people out there, the 600 people stood up and applauded me, I'd be looking at the 200 thinking, disappointed that they've not stood up. I wouldn't be looking at the 400. And again, it's just that perception of it, it's trying to satisfy everyone. Uh. And this is what I'm trying to get to is, is that you just cannot yeah. You will never satisfy everyone. You will never <laughs> please everyone. And the quicker you come to terms with that, the better. Mm. The most important people that you've got to try and, and, well, I say the most important people you've got to try and please is your, your friends and family. But sometimes you won't even please them and they won't please you. And the quicker you accept that as well, the better. Mm. I know now that there's certain friends and there's certain family members that I can spend so much time with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the quicker you deal with that as well, the quicker you understand that your time in and around them, some will be great, some will really help you, some will you'll thrive off and you'll really buzz, really get a buzz from. But there'll be others that can actually drain you and you huh. can find it very difficult in the company. Work that out quickly and work out what's good and what's bad for you because often you better just not stay in and around their company for as long but realise it really quickly. Mm, mate. I've got to ask, how are you going to keep on dispelling this information to people? Because the way you think is bloody fantastic. I, I, I love the journey you've been on. And it is probably because it's been so polar. You've lived the crazy life, the yeah, high yeah. life, and you've lived the deep, deep, dark, dark lows. I, I feel it so strongly in you. Um, this is more of a trivial question, but are, are you going to keep podcasting? Are you going to write a book? I just, I really want to see you talking this truth to as far and wide as you can. I'm so proud of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, to be honest with you, I, I think I was asked to do the, originally I, I, I reached out to Paul and we had a conversation about my mental health and I was really suffering. And um, he just said to me, 
I want to help you, but can you do me a favor? Can you just make sure that when you do, um, can you do a podcast on it? Mm. So I was like, yeah, absolutely. That's not a problem at all. Um, so I did the podcast and then that led to the podcast with Daniel. And then it's obviously a lot led to this one with yourself. So I think the more that it's spoken about, the more that it comes out, the mm. more people will be interested for me to talk about it and, and how I feel and how I learn from certain situations. So do you think you can see yourself actually bringing your own podcast platform out then and, and talking to people? Because you're going to have footballers in there. You're going to have people of that other other category. Could you, do you want to go down that path? Yeah, I think it's something that I'd, I'd possibly look at. I think if I was going to do it, I think it'd be interesting to, to do it with Paul mm. um, because the way he speaks, the way he gets things across, his understanding of things. Now, Paul's been working at this for years. I've been working at this for six months. The, the difference being is, is that I think more people will approach me because of I've been in that situation and it's relatable. Uh, so is Paul as well, but I just mean in the in the world of football or sport and whatever it might be. Mm. But I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one who's been in this situation, but whether um, whether people want to reach out to me and chat, I'm, I'm, I'm open to stuff like that as well. I may absolutely love it. Now, talking about football, <laughs> where you're at, did you know many other players in any of the other teams that you're in that were also struggling, also at low points. Was it a thing to do in your heyday to talk about mental health or did you all just get on with it? Uh, no, just got on with it. Just got really on with did. it. Um, yeah, just because it was um, not seen as the right thing to do. It was, again, it was sign, a, a sign of weakness, if you like. And um, I think now when you think about how much mental health is talked about, especially obviously over the COVID times and things like that, um, I think we're seeing more and more people speaking about it. Mm. But it's something I said on on Daniel's podcast, and I think I, I don't know whether I said it on Paul's as well. Is it's okay speaking to people, but you have got to speak to the right people. Yeah, don't just that, speak to anyone about so it. There's no that. point. Yeah, because th- this is one of the the misconceptions is that I'll just just go and speak to your mate about it. Well, if your mate's giving you the wrong information and the wrong advice, well, what's the bloody point? It's like me going, it's like someone coming to me and asking for advice on, on law. Yeah. I just wouldn't know. I wouldn't be able to tell you. I'd just make bury it the up. body. I'd make it up what I've seen on telly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'd just make it up as what I've seen on telly and that'd be me. So you know, you've, you've got to speak to the right people. It's, it's hugely important. But it, it, was, it was buried at my time in football. But I think even more so now, we're seeing people coming out talking about it. Because... There must be a lot of people that would just think, hang on a minute, he's a footballer, he had loads of money, he had all this success, he was fine. How how can you get low? How can you feel that way? That Genuinely, I'm trying to speak on people's behalf there, but that is a misconception, isn't it? Have you had yeah, anyone is. speak to you on that front? Have you gone, yeah, but come on, man. You, you, you had all this money, you had all this fame, you had all this glory, what are you on about? Have you had that... Not yet, not yet, because I not many people know about this because right. we've been because certain podcasts haven't been released for certain reasons. I think yeah. obviously Paul's releasing his book and he's waiting for everything to be ready to release it. Them discussions will come. Yeah. I know they will. Uh, where people say, but it, it it's everything. It's about the suppression. It's about what you've suppressed in life. Um, the people that you've lost, the grievances you've had that you've not properly grieved for. Um, yeah, it's, it's trying to find a happy balance. It, it, people often think the world of football is a, a great world because you get X amount of money a week. Yeah. It doesn't bring happiness all no. the time, though, um, because ultimately you don't win every week. Mm. So you've got to take the losses. The losses are hard to take. Now, unless you're a very, very successful footballer who plays in a team that wins every week, you've got to le- you've got to learn to deal with losses. They're the hardest parts to deal with. How do you if you don't play well? How do you deal with not playing well? How do you deal with losing every week or or every other week or every couple of weeks? That's tough. I've never um, thought and of they're that. The, yeah. But yeah, but they're the battles that you you face all the time. So when you take that into your home environment and you've not played well and it's mm. dwelling on your mind. And again, we tell ourselves stories uh. out, out of that 50,000 crowd. 
49,000 people hated me today. Well, imagine putting that on yourself every time and taking that home and trying to sleep at night and trying to correct that and then going to try and perform at the highest level in front of them, 49,000 people who hated you again and trying to prove them wrong. How much wow. pressure are you putting on yourself? Wow. That's huge amounts of pressure. Mm. So trying to, trying to do that without actually speaking to anyone about it. Mm. Now you've got the ability to speak to people who can actually help you do what, we, what I've done, mm. work that out, how to, how to change the thinking of that, how to change what people might perceive of you and think of you. God, I wish I could have done that. Mm. I'd have thought about things completely different. Mm. But some people naturally have that ability as well, remember. Some people naturally have an ability to, not to switch off, but they have the ability to work things out naturally. My brother's brilliant at it. Mm. Didn't realize it until I started doing this work. He, he works things out naturally. Mm. It's a gift that he's got. Uh, I do call it a gift because it is a gift to be able to do stuff like that. But he works things out naturally very quickly. Mm. And you, you have to know your, your natural gifts, don't you? You have to be really yeah. aware of them because you can play Absolutely. with them. Then. You can truthfully yeah. go down that path of them. And the things yeah. that you do yeah. really struggle with, you have to also know them because you either have to really beat on your ass and work on them or tell people around and say, listen, I'm really prone to this. It may come mm. out in our relationship, in our friendship, whatever it is. Yeah. Please let me know if I've fallen to it. So it, yeah. it, it, oh, it, our podcast is called the self-awareness podcast today. It's just that yeah. constant tuning back in, tuning back in and knowing yourself to the best of its yeah. ability. I, I, uh, there's, there's one that I'll list. Uh, well, there's something that I look at quite often on Twitter. There's a, there's a DJ in Liverpool called Lee Butler. Now Lee's a household name for years, but he was a depressant and an alcoholic. I'm probably, I think he's a drug user as well. He won't mind me saying this because he's, he's open about it on Twitter. Now Lee's been clean for years and he's never been happier. But one thing he, he does now is he, he helps people to recover and tells them what life is like and things like that. And I actually saw um, a comment from someone yesterday and it was brilliant. He said, um, he said, I went on holiday to rest for the first time and came back refreshed because I didn't have a drink. Mm. He said, because what often happens is you go on holiday and you feel like this pressure to drink. <laughs> yeah. It's like your friends Have a good go time, have go, a good time. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going to have to have a drink yeah. and, and, and things like that. And it, it's not about that. It's about setting things up nicely for the day. That's how you rest. Mm. And that's how you relax. I actually walked past a lady yesterday at the bus stop and I, I, I felt like turning around and stopping and saying, that's not, that's exactly not what you need. I walked past her and she went, I just need a glass of wine. I desperately need a glass of wine. And I was thinking, <laughs> you don't, you yeah. need something else because there's more to your life going on in your head than a glass of wine's going to sort out. And this is the thing as well. It, it, it's it's the the stories again that we hear growing up and that we yeah. tell ourselves so often. So true, but, man. Mm. But when I when I when you, when you mentioned there about um, what what you like and what you don't like, often what you'll find with and this is something that again I, I've like worked out myself is go on a stag do, and people are like we're going to get absolutely hammered and we're going to do this and this and everyone's doing it. Well, imagine that one person who's thinking, I don't actually want to do that. Mm. Mm. And I don't really fancy doing that. Imagine the anxiety and the what pressure an he's feeling or she's place. feeling turning up. Do you know, rather than turning up and, and being, out, being confident enough to just go, do you know what? I'll have a few, but I, I just it's not for me. Mm. And I'm just going to join in when I want, but don't worry about me. I'll have a great time. Mm. No one ever gives you that opportunity to have one or two, still dance, still chat to people, still have a great time, still join in the banter that the lads are all having. Mm. It's like, no chance. Out you go, mate. You're not part of this group. If you, if you can't drink 10 pints of beer and have 20 shots on a night and feel like shit the next day with mm. all of us, because that's how I want to feel and I want someone else next to me to feel the same way. And that is effectively what they're trying to do. So I look at things now and when I go on a night out, I just go, no, I'm not drinking tonight. Or I'll have one or two, but I know my limits and I know when I want to go out. Well, you've, and the, I was I've just going to say, you've, you've built up this resilience and confidence 
to truthfully yeah. know what you want and how you're going to get it. And I suppose yeah, yeah. that's you in the dressing room. You've got 20 lads all sat around in a circle. Absolutely. Everybody's on it. They know what they want. And you just felt, oh, I've got to put on my brave face today, brave mask and just get on with it rather than say, listen, yeah. guys, I, I, I'm actually going to be a detriment to the team if I play now because I'm so deep in my head, so deep in my struggle. Absolutely. And you just felt yeah. you, you had no ability to say that. Yeah, and I look at the athlete at the moment. I forget her name. The American. Oh girl, yeah, what a what an inspiration. Yeah, yeah. where she stepped aside because mm -hmm. she just said, "I'm not going to perform. I'm not going to perform at that level." Mm. And there was a lot of people who who had a go at her, who were not athletes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you go, okay, so you've have you ever been in that environment? You ever understood what it's like to be in that environment? Oh man! And and that was what you found. Whereas a lot of athletes turned around and went, finally, mm. finally a voice, a voice who's willing to speak up. Wow! Um, and, that, and that was one of the made big me things. emotional. That did just that. I just yeah. got me then because you think on even the lowest of levels, somebody's done something where they've been desperate not to be there. Yeah, the amount yeah. of stages I've been on in front of a few hundred, mate, a lot of people, enough enough eyes in front of you, and you're just like, what am I doing? Yeah. And you, to not have that empathy, and to not have that understanding, and to just go on the attack, you've got to have a lot of hate in your heart to get there, haven't you? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but again, it comes up from that built-up frustration of their tough, their tough life that they're suppressing things. Yeah, so it's yeah. what what's the answer? The answer is to hit out and yeah. to hit out in any way they can. And often it's a it's a self-reflection. I, I love that you always have a compassionate element to add in because to them people who are just hate-filled, it's yeah. so easy to look back and go, what a bunch of wankers. But for you to go, oh, wow, they've, they've got their own struggles. They've clearly not been in that position before. They've got pain that they're repressing and they're just showing, showcasing. Well, I've I've been that dickhead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have. I've been the one who's got angry at people. Yeah. Uh, I'm frustrated, and then I look back at things now, and I go, "Oh wow, um, like why did I do that?" And yeah. I know now. I know why I did it because it was mm. a reflection of how I felt as well, and it, it it angered me in that way. Can I just ask, interestingly, like when was? Because we said the timeline very succinctly at the start of the uh, podcast. When was the lowest? Where were you at? Where you thought, Stevie, you you you're out of here now. You, you're gonna. It could be an end it all situation. Yeah, that was just before a text Paul. Um, like really, really struggling. Um, I'm like I was currently going for it or going for a divorce and um, wasn't really speaking to my kids and things like that. And that still, was tough. still playing yeah. football at this position that you were still. No, 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 no. I was, this After is math. six months ago. Yeah. Right. This is wow. uh, sort of two and, uh, well, three years into retirement, um, not having a structure of day to day. Um, it was during lockdown as well, which was very tough because mm. you, you can't even get out and meet people and speak to people and go and see your mates and things like that. And it, uh, work could, was obviously, the football had stopped, so you weren't even traveling anywhere. It was it was a tough time. Um, so that was where I was I was really low, and I just thought, you know what, I'm in big, big trouble here. That was the one thing on um, the podcast. I've not seen the one with Paul yet, but the one with Dan. And absolutely love the journey you both went on. But, you know, when you sat back and you're like, oh, I wonder if he's going to ask this, and it doesn't quite come through. Because at the minute, as a farm, as a collective, as a family, we're going through the transition period now. Sort of my mum, yeah. as she got on this farm, it's a really cool story. I'll tell you another time when we have a bevy. <laughs> but <laughs> she, she got this farm uh, through crazy circumstances. There was a court involved. Now, she's been this incredible, inspiring lady who has worked her ass off since she was 10 years old to, to now yeah. she's getting into her late 50s. And it's horse riding. Everyone sort of in the horsing community knows the name Becky Mullen for Rose. And yeah. it's a breaking yard. So she's doing the buckaroo sort of style, getting these naughty oh, okay. horses into good states to be to be riding. Now, I, me and my partner, we had the COVID a few about a month ago, really ill. Woke up one morning, there's an air ambulance on the, the field. 
running yeah. through. Thought it's my mum. It wasn't, but it's a friend. And as horses do, a horrible accident happened. Yeah. So my mum is trying to resuscitate a friend. Oh, Unfortunately, yeah, the, the worst case scenario happened. Now, she doesn't feel able to go back and perform this thing that she's done for 40 plus years yeah so her period of time of knowing something of doing has been huge and now she's going through that transition that you had to go through which yeah. was oh my god my whole life's just been swept under my feet what do I do so I've re- I was fascinated to hear somebody who'd played for Liverpool England football 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 from 10 years old what the hell? What do you do? Yeah. Do you do? It's, and it is short-lived. Football's so malleable. You've got, what is it, 34, 35, if you're really yeah, yeah. lucky? Yeah. Swept out. That is going to cause a lot of struggle for anybody uh, in yeah, that yeah, field. Of so, yeah, but The one thing I'd say about your mum is, is that it's uh, from, listen, I've only literally just heard that story for the first time. But mm. again, the, the problem we do is, or the problem we have is, is I mean, was your mum at the at the scene when it happened, and did she see it? Mm. Is that is that right, or yeah. did she not? Yeah, she was there. So she was the teacher, so it was just her and that person, and that's where it happened. Yeah. yeah. But the thing is, is that if you were to drive a car every day, at one point you might have an accident. Mm. For for how many years you're doing it, you're always going to get an accident at some point. And listen. A fatality is just, it's horrific and, and, and it's not a nice situation, but you've got a, the biggest thing you've got to do is not suppress it and is to learn from it. Mm. Um, it's like anything, isn't it? What can I actually learn from that situation so that it doesn't occur again? Mm. And, and it's having that trust to know that you can actually sit back and look at that and go, okay, so what are the steps I need to take? Writing down everything that you could have done differently. I'm working on it. And, mm. and they're, the, they're the things that you've got to have a trust in yourself, not to just turn around and go, it, it, it's like me, me speaking and saying something wrong on TV. And, and listen, I know it's not the same, but I'm trying to just uh, yeah, man, give an, I, an example. I, I like it. Where, but where I, I say something wrong on TV, but if I said something wrong and never went back onto the TV again, mm. then what do, I do, what do I do next? Well, I don't. I go, okay, well, I made a mistake there. So how do I now rectify that how do I learn from that and do something different and and that's what I've taken from all this is that you're never going to get everything right in life and sometimes you're just going to have to evaluate learn from it and take the next step forward which is which is often to to go back on the tv to go back on the radio to Mm. to start the lessons again and things like that the answer isn't just to suddenly dismiss everything and Mm. start something completely different it's to that is where the suppression comes from Hmm. is because we we back away because we we get fearful of it and we go oh, i can't do that that's that's the fear element kicking in so um it's it's a very difficult one to to sort of learn but you you've got to you've got to try and do it as much as you can and the same with everything man that pe- that nugget there of knowledge is going to be a building block of so many other things to come along the way for people so it is it's yeah. taken in as a constant that's a, a beautiful essence idea and maybe that can help overcome for anybody who's going yeah. through that at the moment and same with you know I, I've been performing for so long and I had a few really tricky times on stage um I suffer with um slight flashbacks after being so engrossed in the substances yeah. sometimes when I get in a height of anxiety I'll have a bit of a a real anxiety attack on the stage and that put me off from going for a while a, a piece of advice I've got in essence for, for moving on is what you said you don't just have to flip it all on its head and say right I'm gonna just work in finance now or go over here yeah. but it's what you've seemed to have done remained in the industry found interesting parts that you want to be involved in like commentary like yeah. whatever it is so with me it's I'm going into studio spaces now and yeah. working a lot more on my craft still and yeah. after a while it's given me the fire and the passion back to go back on a stage and like, I, I'm kind of ready again now I feel, I feel good but yeah. I remained in that place uh still and I, I don't know if that works for people but especially with what I do it's 
yeah, maybe you need a bit of time out. That's okay. Don't yeah, worry I about think it. Have, the other thing there is, is like what you've said there, straight away the thing that sticks out to me is, is that you have a flashback to a certain moment when you get anxious. Now mm. what you've got to do is work out what gets you anxious. Mm. So you've got to strip it back and go, okay, so what was it that led to that stage that got me anxious? Yeah. But what can I what can I do moving forward to stop me getting anxious on the stage? What will actually help me to to get to to sort of nullify that feeling and take that away? I suppose and, for and self, th- th- one thing I've learned, which just backing onto you from there, is uh being more practiced. The fe- where I feel really anxious is when I've not been ready for it. So yeah, when yeah, I yeah. feel really confident and comfortable, I'm like, I know my words, I know what I'm doing. That's where it's so not happening. So you know you're underprepared. Mm, yeah. That that's where the anxious and that's where the anxiety comes from. It's because mm. you actually know even before you step onto that stage, you're underprepared. Bang on. So again, can you fix that? Absolutely, mm. you can. And mm. and that, there's there's there where lies the problem straight away. Mm. But it, sometimes it's not until you actually think about it and you you. When you have these discussions, you often know the answers before you say it mm. and uh, before you actually overthink it and you, you actually know it, but you don't want to admit it. Mm. One of the biggest things in football or in, in the music industry is, is it's bloody hard work mm. and it takes a lot of time and effort to, to rehearse and to practice and things like that. And people often think, oh, I'll be fine. I'll get mm-hmm. away with it. Yeah. But then in the back of the mind, they actually know I haven't prepared for this mm. and I haven't got it right. So one of the big things I used to do when I when I played was I used to like hit a certain weight on a Friday. I used to like to be, I used to call it my, my fighting weight. So I knew if I was in the round that weight, I was good. But the things that was were also important was Thursday, Friday, Saturday, what I ate, what I drank. Now I knew if I was prepared in that, that was my practice for you. Mm. If I knew I was prepared in that, the rest would take care of itself on the football pitch. I'd, I'd be in a good state to, to do that. Now, there was times where even when I had maybe drank something that I shouldn't have, done something that, I, like, ate something that I shouldn't have, I beat myself up going yeah. onto the stage and I get, like, I get anxious about it going, going out to play that football game when really would it have had that much of a difference and would it have really have affected me? But mm. it wasn't that. It was the story I told myself in my head. Mm. If you drink that bad, if you drink that, that can of Coke, that's going to slow you down on a Saturday. That's mm. going to ha- hit, ha- like him. Uh, uh, um, that's going to hinder your performance at the weekend. So I'm going out onto a football pitch now, thinking of one can of Coke or one chocolate bar that is going to stop me completing a pass, making a run, heading the ball. <laughs> it's it's going to have no relevance at all. Yeah, absolutely no bearing on it. Yeah, but I'd tell myself that story. Wow. So again, it's the stories we tell ourselves when we go on to stage. Yeah. Whereas when we actually grow up and we play football and we pick a guitar up for the first time and it just flows, it's just natural. Mm. We learn it because we love it, but then we heap this pressure on ourselves all of a sudden because we've got a crowd or we've got whatever. Mm. But the more relaxed you are, the, the better you'll feel. And from that, from what I was saying there, was that a big catalyst, the transition period of your depression? I know there was a magnitude of factors. Was it a catalyst? Was yeah. it a part of it? And there was so much more yeah, yeah. surrounding it. Yeah, I think the big thing for me was structure, was, yeah. was everyday life. Um, that was one of the things I really struggled with, was not being having things in place for that day. So where I was going to be during the day, what time I'd have to be there and things like that. Again, I was I was told where to be, what to do, what to eat, and things like that. And suddenly, that was taken away from me. Right, yeah. And and I thought that was completely abnormal. That's not. <laughs> that's, that's not abnormal. <laughs> again, that that was a story I'd told myself in my head was that I needed this and I needed this structure, and I needed to be told what to be doing. Well, I don't. I'm fine. I, I, life's good without it. Um, it's actually easier to be able to live your life freely and get up and do what you want to do. And I'm going to eat what I want to eat today. Why? Because I want to. Hmm. Is it going to affect me? No, it's not really. So just get on with it. Life's great. Hmm. Have you have you got a big whiteboard at home? I have, yeah. Yeah. Mine's full of, Span- Mine's full of Spanish, though. Oh, right. Okay, yeah, you're learning Spanish as well now. Was, yeah. was that something Paul suggested to you as you're moving on from something else or...? No, no, it was, it was just, um, 
I, when I was sort of suffering, I was, well, it was just, yeah, it was in the round anyway, but it was during the uh, lockdown. I just thought, I don't want to just sit here and watch Netflix the whole time and just complete Netflix, basically. Yeah, I yeah. thought, this is an opportunity now to actually learn a language. I've always wanted to do it, but I've never had the time. So I think initially we all thought, well, lockdown's going to be three months. So I thought, well, I'll have a, I'll have a crack for three months and see how I get on. Mm. Um, and I'm still going now. So it's great. Mate, that's fantastic. I do. There was just a couple of anecdotes that I would like to brush to. Um, one from the Dan podcast, there were some managers yeah. that really knocked your confidence. You don't have to name the names, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you can, because I, I, what I loved about you at Dan's podcast was just your stubbornness in, with some of the coaches like, no, I didn't do it. So what are you on about? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 that's interesting, actually. Is that um, been a good part of your life? Has that been a blessing and a curse, the stubbornness? Um, no, it's been a, it's been a curse really. Yeah. Um, because, uh, it's, it's a, it's a character, mm. isn't it? It's another character that you, you, you have that wants to come out and mm. wants mm. to, wants to cause problems, which mm. could, could do without, to be honest with you. Um, I, I really loved it. But, and I, I'd saw a lot of myself I, I, in that. <laughs> yeah. But I'd also say that it was also self-reflective of that manager who was stubborn. So it bought out the worst of me because it was a self-reflection. It was mm. a mirror image. So it, it caused us to, to, to go at loggerheads. And really, if I'd have just gone, whatever. Um, mm. It's something I look back on now and go, would I have changed it? Yeah, I probably would. I'd have probably gone in and, and apologised. I'd have probably done different things at the time. Though there was no way. I was backing down. I was, I was a nightmare at the time. Um, so... Was there any managers then that, you know, the button together where you thought this isn't working, they knocked your confidence massively because they, again, can you just tell the story where you were going to play in the Champions League for my audience and then he just took you off of it? So um, I was meant to be in the Champions League uh, final squad and I, we got told the squad like to, uh, straight after training so we were flying out to Istanbul two days earlier than the game. And then about two, three hours later, I got a phone call from the assistant manager who told me that I was uh, no longer in the squad and that they'd made a mistake on it. Um, and that was just, that was hard to take because again, it hadn't come from the manager, it come from the assistant manager. Mm. Um, but there was no apology. There was no, there was nothing after it. Um, I think I ended up speaking to him about four or five weeks later when we came back into training because I literally didn't really see him. Mm. Uh, until that moment and and that was that was tough to take yeah it was because what I, what I was alluding to is it just seems so ruthless as an industry they just there's yeah, no care towards you were there any mm. managers that came in or who you played under that you thought wow this is a different approach this is somebody that actually cares about our mental health well-being and has a, a little bit of love element beside them yeah th there was there's certain ones, but just going back to your point about football being ruthless, there's a mm. saying in football, there's a saying in football, that's football. Mm. Oh, God. And, and, and that's what a lot of people <laughs> that's, say. That's how it is. That's football. Just how it, oh, yeah, that, God. Uh, yeah, and that's that's football. Um, however, yeah, but the one thing you'll always find about managers is that there'll be managers who, who like you and there'll be managers who don't like you. So your opinion of managers will always be different to someone else's because that manager might like you, but might not like them. But the one who doesn't like you might like them, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. So you'll always have a difference of opinion on people. It, it's always great. I mean, if, if, you, if you don't like me, then I'm not really going to be that fond of you either. Mm. It's going to be a bit of a, a clash of heads, isn't it? Whereas mm. if we get on and it's great, then great. That, that's great. Yeah, I really like you. Mm. Um, it makes life easier so um, you'll always find that within the football industry um, you'll never ever again please everyone mm. it's, it's about football's a game of opinions and what I've slowly <laughs> realised over the last few months is so is life yeah yeah and the quicker you deal with people's opinions about you again it all comes round on a vicious cycle of everything that we've spoke about mm. on this podcast so far is is that it comes down to people's opinions. Yeah. And the quicker you deal with people's opinions and ref and get used to that, you are not going to please everyone, the quicker you'll deal with life. 
mate. I, I've, I've absolutely been blown away by this podcast. It's every journey we've been on. Yeah, it's been over here and over there and over here. But there is this running theme, isn't it? There really is yeah. about anywhere you're at. And it's it's just staying completely true to yourself, really understanding yourself wherever you're at now. How true are you being? How honest are you being to that reflective self, that authentic, true yeah. part of you? And I, I absolutely love it. I suppose in some industries where it is high profile, like um, the football industry, the music industry, there's a little bit of bum kissing you've got to do, isn't there? There's a little bit where you've got to play a certain role. And Yeah, I think the, the, the tends to, that's the perception of things. But right. again, what most people want is honesty. Yeah. Don't yeah. do things that you're that you're not happy to do. So you might be kissing someone's ass to get a yeah. role, but that role actually doesn't suit you. Yeah. And you, you're not actually playing that role that you want to play because huh. you're not actually happy that you've took the role from kissing ass. That's basically where role. I was going with that. I completely yeah. felt it. In my heart yeah. and in my head from what you were saying, I was like, I bet there's a lot of players that feel they have to be perceived by the manager a certain way, be perceived by the team a certain way. But the, the most integral, vital part of it is, no, if you're living yourself out as true to possibly be and you've still got your talent, you're going to get to that position regardless. Yeah. I, I played with a player who, I, I won't name him, mm. but he, he smoked like a chimney mm. and it was known. And he, he liked to gamble, he liked to drink, but he had it under control, like really under control. But he was dead happy in training and he played extremely well. And the manager knew it, but imagine a manager coming in who didn't like that side of him because it mm. was self-reflecting or he couldn't cope with it. And he just thought, no, I'm, gonna, I'm not having that. I'm not having someone who smokes in my team. I'm not having someone who likes a drink. Well, you're not ever going to have that player who's happy then. So then you're taking a player who performs every, every single week and then he tries to change him. I'd, it's one of the things that I've often been asked is why, why aren't you a manager and things like that? Um, why couldn't you do it? it it's like you're, you're a counsellor for people to try and juggle all these personalities and put all these personalities. You've got to try and keep so many people happy. And um, that is essentially what you are trying to do as a manager. It's one of the greatest gifts, I think, uh, that managers have is that the ability to manage 25, 30 guys in a changing room and mm. keep them all happy. Very, very difficult skill set to do. But if you do that and you, you take per people's personalities, listen, you've got, to, you've got to toe the line at, at times and you've got to put people in the place and tell them that, listen, you're not going out this weekend. We've got a game on Tuesday or Wednesday. Mm. They'll respect it. They will respect it. And they'll go, do you know what? Yeah, he's great with me all, all the other time. So for this one time, I won't go out or I won't do what he whatever happens, but do you know what? I'm dead happy and I'm coming in every day and he's, he's given me the freedom to express myself. Mm. And I'm, the best that I'm, I'm in the best environment that I can be in. To create an environment is the most one of the most important things in life as well. Mm. Create a happy environment and it brings everything around it as yeah. well. <laughs> wow. Do you, do you see the game changing? Are you, are you optimist about where, the, where we're going? Um, yeah, I think the game's the game's changed massively since I retired. Even the side of sports psychology is is, is ramping up and things like that. I think the press and the media are more receptive to it. I mm. think we're seeing that as well. I think they want to be more receptive to it because I think it again it's self reflective. The, the media and the press are under huge pressure to put put articles out and put things out. Uh, they're not always perceived in in the greatest light, if you like, but. I think that is, again, it's a self-reflection of why they do hit out. And I think what we're seeing now is we're seeing the, the, the articles that are being written, the things that are being said on TV. It's all getting better because we're all self-reflecting better mm. as well. Mm. Thanks to COVID, maybe. <laughs> There's a, <laughs> a light and a darkness with it. I know a lot of people have yeah. struggled, but uh, the conversations I'm having at the local pub or anywhere I'm going yeah, yeah. now with, with the lads, lads, <laughs> it is a completely different turnaround. I, I yeah. love the fact that a lot of my friends where I'd just constantly go see them and they're working in this nine to five industry and always going, Mikey, how the hell did you break out of this? I, I, I hate my job. I hate the da, da, da. They're actually all talking to me now going, I'm doing something about it. 
COVID has shown yeah. me I can actually lose a job that means nothing to me. So why not give a crack at something that means something to me? And I'm like, oh, this yeah. is the reflection I've been waiting for. This is where we're at. So yeah. I think it's the fear. It's the telling mm. yourself a story again. Yeah. Again, and you, you you tell yourself that story that is probably never going to happen. Um, and the quicker people get over them stories in the head and put them to bed, the more they'll move forward and be happy. Dude, if if you and Kopi ever need a filmmaker to come and sit and do your podcast, let, <laughs> let me be there because I'm going to be <laughs> one elevated man from a couple of them sessions. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely Great. fantastic. Dude, uh, we've got stuff to do today. I know you've got stuff to do today. I yeah. can't thank you enough, man. Honestly, th- there is just so many nuggets in this podcast and I'm so happy I've gone. This is my first ever Zoom meeting on a podcast. I like to do Great. it face to face, but I-, I do understand that I've eradicated a lot of great conversation that could exist by not doing it via Zoom. So I'm really yeah. excited to the people I'm going to meet on the way uh, doing it this way as well. Yeah, I can imagine. But I really appreciate you having me on. And uh, it's been hopefully people take something out of it. And um, if they if they do, then it's, it's been worth every every second of doing it. And and if they do, where can they see more of you? What what sort of platforms or where will you be putting all your new podcast content <laughs> new whatever yeah so I, i'm on instagram my my, my instagram handle stephen warnock three my twitter has the same at stephen warnock three um a lot of my stuff will probably be going on to onto those two platforms mostly um but who knows where it's gonna go maybe uh, a youtube channel and things like that in the future will uh, will definitely come so fingers crossed You've got one subscriber here, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, thank you. Guys, you've been a part of the Old Farm Bus, Back of the Bus Sessions podcast. Again, what do we say? This is the last thing I leave you on. Just be nice to one another, you beautiful buggers. That's all you got to do. <laughs> Big love to you. Big love, man.